We are on our way with diagnostic testing up in this tier. Pay attention to similarities between the bacterium in this lecture as well as compared to ones in the past modules. Campylobacter is an oxidase positive microbe that likes to grow in warm environments. Generally your guts keep quite warm and it provides a very suitable home for this bug. Do you remember what other oxidase positive microbes we've covered in the past modules? It is also an acid resistant bacterium which may allow it to survive the stomach's acidic environment if ingested. As it is often found in common western dietary foods, this causes a problem. Statewide outbreaks are not uncommon and often linked back to food sources. H. pylori is also oxidase positive, but this is not the commonly tested enzyme reaction. Urease positivity is much more important as it is used in the urea breath test helped to diagnose H. pylori. Although more invasive tests are available, the breath test is a quick and easy check for H. pylori. Swallowing a pill that reacts with the enzyme produced by the bug is much more acceptable and affordable than scoping a patient. You may also try to culture with silver stain, but this is not the preferred method over breath test. It is a motile bacterium, but what is interesting is the prevalence. H. pylori is found in about 50% of the world's population. And as we don't all have ulcers, this indicates there is another mitigating factor that predisposes some to further disease. VAC-A is a toxin that causes vacuolating within the stomach's cells, leading to damage in these cells. With improperly functioning cells, the GI tract becomes more susceptible to the acidic environment. Vibrio now makes the third oxidase positive bug in a row. It's an interesting similarity without a clear purpose. However, it does help to separate these out from the Enterobacteraceae family, which are oxidase negative. Cholera also has the ADP ribosylation discussed in a past lecture. This toxin causes severe diarrhea by decreasing human protein activity and increasing water into the lumen of the bowel. It can be described as comma-shaped with shooting star motility on culture, but these buzzwords are less and less frequent for testing purposes. Despite being infected via the fecal-oral route, this microbe is not acid-resistant as Campylobacter is. It is thought that individuals with decreased immune systems or decreased stomach acid levels are more prone to these infections. For our respiratory infections, let's begin again with Legionella. This one in particular fits better in this module than with the other Ella sisters. If you recall, we stated this is a difficult microbe to culture. It requires a very special blood charcoal yeast extract culture medium. This medium has the cysteine amino acid and iron mineral, which are factors required for Legionella to grow. Alternatively, we could try to culture with a sputum sample, but urine antigen testing is a much more common testing method. So if someone was to come in with a pneumonia-like symptom, how would we decide if we should test for this pathogen over other pneumo-causing bugs? The demographic of elderly individuals, smokers, or a history of recent travel is usually a red flag for testing and clinical suspicion. This intracellular bug, as stated before, likes water environments like AC and swamp coolers. Bordetella is also a very difficult one to culture. It has a special Reagan Low medium or Bordet Jingel medium that must be used. It will show up as negative on blood cultures, so requires throat cultures for the diagnosis. As pertussis is still very rare in industrialized nations, it is uncommon to be tested on currently, though this might change in the near future. Some of these virulence factors pertussis possesses include a pili and K antigen, or capsule. These capsules help some bacteria evade the immune system. B. pertussis also has an ADP ribose factor, as discussed in cholera. These factors influence the G proteins within cells that mediate many other cellular functions. A mother's immune system also will not relate to the offspring's immunity, which is why vaccinations are important in prevention for the mother and newborn. It's also very easy to confuse the Tdap and Td variations of this vaccine. Tdap is a combination of three vaccines, which is required in childhood. Only the Td booster is needed in adolescence and adulthood. For some reason, all the microbes in this module are just difficult to culture. Even Haemophilus requires a special medium, the Isovitali X agar. Remember the V and the X 
in the name, as those equal the special factors seen in the agar, factor X and factor V. When microbes are difficult to culture, such as Hib, it is difficult to get accurate epidemiology statistics as many countries don't have the means for detection. Haemophilus can also grow on chocolate agar, as seen previously. Though less commonly tested anymore, the Quilung reaction is also a factor that can be used to differentiate this bug. It allows for easier visualization under the microscope. Once again, we see IgA protease enzyme. What other bugs can you think of that produce this enzyme, and what is the function? The thumb sign was mentioned in the last here, but in this image we can see it a little clearer. The epiglottis is very distinct on the lateral view x-ray, almost looking like a hitchhiker's thumb coming from the anterior throat. If the Quilung reaction occurs with capsules, then we already know this is an encapsulated bacterium, and antibodies are an important aspect in the immune system in clearing encapsulated bacteria. For asplenic patients, they have decreased antibiotic production and mechanisms for opsonization, making them especially susceptible to disease. Pseudo is coagulase positive, like Staphylococcus aureus, and oxidase positive, like most of the microbes in this module, as its clinical presentation is quite different than most of them in this module, we shouldn't easily mix them up on any testing questions. Being a non-fermenter, it's also relatively low yield for this pathogen. Some interesting characteristics that could be used for associations include the exotoxin A seen in Pseudomonas and how it affects cells. Like cholera and pertussis, it also uses ADP ribosylation pathways. Its effect is different in that it inhibits the elongation factor 2 in cells, which inhibits cell synthesis. This leads to cell death through apoptosis. It also has an interesting blue-green color, as seen in this culture, and a unique odor that has been described as grape-like. These are caused by pyocyanin, which also causes host cell damage. These are more likely to be buzzword type clues in exams than clinically useful. It has the H antigen virulence factor, which means this bacteria is flagellated or mobile. These antigens are really only useful as targets for vaccines as they modulate immune reactivity, but it may also explain how an area of infection can spread quickly to another area. For any patients with burns, we discuss this as a potentially lethal infection, but also think of it with CF patients and diabetics due to the decreased respiratory clearance and decreased immune response, respectively. All right, that's it for the third tier of this module. How are you feeling so far? I know I need a break, but we do still have one more tier to cover in this module. Luckily, we have already covered the main categories of antibiotics, so there will be less to cover broadly from here on out. Some of the last tier for future modules may be used for summary and review sections as well. Though repetition in these lecture videos aim to help learners' retention, our in-course assignments add variety as well. If you are watching these videos via YouTube, head over to freemeded.org and register for the next course release. The supplemental resources, reviews, and recommendations handed out throughout each module can really help synthesize the massive quantity of material we are covering in a very short period of time. This is more of a flipped classroom design and requires peer and instruction interaction for full benefit.